All right, everybody. Um, thanks for sticking around for the last session on the last day of RedisConf here. Uh, my name is Tom Mooney. I'm with Learning.com in Portland, Oregon. Uh, we make um, educational software for school districts around the country, K through eight, mostly focusing on um, digital literacy skills, so teaching like keyboarding, um, how to use spreadsheets, some coding, stuff like that. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about um, event sourcing, event-driven microservices, and how you can do that uh, using Redis. So um, first of all, so microservices. All right, great. Um, <laughs> anybody who's actually implemented microservices can probably relate to this slide. Um, you know, it's great in a lot of ways. Gives us a lot of benefits as far as scalability, uh, maintainability, performance. Um, stuff like that, but also comes with its own set of headaches. Um, so one of those challenges that you don't have in a monolithic application is how do you communicate between microservices? Uh, so today I'm going to talk about some strategies for doing that by making services event-driven, um, and then some specific patterns that we can use to implement event-driven microservices, um, specifically event sourcing and command query response separation. Um, and how Redis can help us uh, implement those patterns. Uh, and then I'll just go through a demo, um, look at some code, how we can actually do that, go through a .NET Core uh, demo application. Okay, so like I said, one of our main issues with uh, microservices how, is how do you communicate? So, you know, you can start doing microservices and you can say, all right, great, I'll just put an HTTP API on each of my services and they'll communicate that way. Perfect, so if we take an example, um, just think of like some generic you know, ordering system where you're going online ordering something. So you might have your client, um, it's making a call to your order service to place an order. Then you might have a customer service um, that you need to you know, update the, the customer record in the customer service to associate an order. Um, one thing I should mention here too is that one of the main tenants with microservices is that each microservice should have its own data store that is not directly um, accessed by any other service. Uh, so in this case, we need to keep each of those data so stores in sync. Um, the customer service needs to update its data store with uh, information about an order for a particular customer. We might have an invoice service that needs to send an invoice to the customer. Um, we might have some sort of inventory service where we need to update our inventory after an order is placed. So great, we've got this set up. We're making HTTP calls between all of these uh, to update their data stores when an order comes in. Everything's perfect, um, except there's uh, some issues with this. Um, first of all, these services are all really tightly coupled. They all need to know about each other, they need to know what the API is on each of those. Um, the order service has to know about the customer service, customer service has to know about the invoice service, and on and on. So we've lost one of our main benefits of microservices, which is having loose coupling between our services. Uh, there can also be some performance issues here. As you get more and more of those HTTP calls, uh, your, your whole system is going to get slower and slower as you do that. Uh, and then finally, what happens if that goes away? You're in trouble because if you, you can, you no longer know that your data is in a consistent state. Um, if you make, you know, your order service needs to make a call to the customer service to update its data, and if that fails, what do you do? Either the order service has to roll back a transaction, um, none of your other uh, data stores are gonna get updated, um, and most likely you're just gonna have to throw an error back to, the, back to the client until you can get that customer service back up. All right, so uh, this is a, an illustration of, of the CAP theorem, which uh, is basically that it's, um, I'm sure people have heard of this before, but um, it's basically that it's, it's impossible for any distributed system to guarantee all three of these things at once. Um, so you can either have, you can have two out of the three of these things. And in reality, uh, we know that we can never really depend on the network. So that partition tolerance, that net network partition tolerance, 
is something that we know is going to happen. So really the choice is between consistency and availability. Um, so in that last example, we're probably going to sacrifice availability for consistency. Uh, we want to make sure that our data and all of those data stores is consistent, so we're going to throw an error back to our, um, our user, which is not the ideal situation. Um, so by making services event-driven, we can actually have both. Um, and I'll talk about how we can do that. So here's um, kind of how we can go about making services event-driven. Um, so instead of making HTTP calls between all of the services, now the client just calls the order service. Uh, the order service fires off an order created event, uh, puts that onto the message queue, which then fires off an event to each of these other services that in turn update their own data stores. Um, so now with this kind of a setup, um, we've decoupled the services. The order service doesn't need to know anything about the customer service, doesn't need to know anything about the inventory service. And you can add even other services without having to touch the order service at all. Um, our writes are also now inherently atomic because it's only one, one write to that message queue. Um, so uh, so the, the system can now maintain both availability and consistency. If the customer service is down, uh, the order service and the client don't really care. Um, but the, the catch is that it's now eventually consistent. Um, we can be assured that at some point, like if the customer service goes down, once it comes back up, it can process all of the events that it has waiting in its queue, and its data will be updated. But we're not guaranteed that that's going to happen um, immediately, obviously. Um, so this also takes care of some of the performance um, issues that you have making a bunch of HTTP calls between services since now everything is asynchronous. You can add as many other services listening to events coming from the order service, and it's not going to affect the performance of the client at all. All right, so, um, all right, so, there's, so you want to do microservices. You want to make event-driven services. There's a lot of different ways that you can do that. Um, so you know, one of the main things you need to do is have some sort of messaging system. And there's a lot of tools out there. Um, you know, the one that all the cool kids are using is Kafka. There's stuff like RabbitMQ that's been out there for a long time. But um, Redis can actually be a perfectly capable uh, message queue. Um, and one of the, the main selling points for us at learning.com is that we were already using it. Um, it was already a key part of our, our infrastructure. So once we decided we wanted to you know, set up event-driven services, we didn't have to set up a whole new piece of infrastructure to be able to do that. We could just use what we already had. Um, so that obviously lowers costs. And for our operations department, it's, they don't have to maintain uh, or install a whole new piece of infrastructure. Our developers don't need to learn uh, how to use a new piece of infrastructure. So um, that's why to use Redis. So uh, as far as the nuts and bolts of actually implementing this, so this is you know, this is a pretty well-known pattern uh, with Redis. It's actually um, documented pretty well on the Redis site. It's the reliable message queue pattern. Um, except we've added one, one more piece to this, and it's, it's a, uh, a list of subscribers and uh, um, subscribers to a particular uh, pub sub channel. So just to walk through how this works. So, Basically, when a, when a service comes up and it wants to subscribe to an event from, from another service, it'll add itself to uh, an event publisher to a, a, a set of subscribers to that particular event. OK, so now the service that's publishing that event will go and look in that set and look for all of the subscribers to that particular event. And it will publish uh, to a channel to a pub sub channel in Redis for each of those subscribers. And then from there, it's the, it's the, the basic reliable queue pattern. Um, where the event publisher publishes an event. Uh, when it does that, the event doesn't actually contain the actual event data inside of it. It writes that 
data to a published list for that particular subscriber. Um, so the event is basically just saying, hey, subscriber, you have data waiting for you in your published list. Go and get it. So the event subscriber then goes and grabs its data out of the published list. And it uses the rpop lpush command, which is an, an atomic command that will read out of this published list um, right to, the, to a processing list. So now that particular data is being processed. Um, it will do its processing, and as soon as that completes successfully, it'll delete that data out of the processing list. Um, so this, this gives us a, a, a reliable cue. If anything goes wrong in that situation, so say there's no subscriber listening to a particular event, if you're just using PubSub, um, you know, Redis, the PubSub functionality in Redis is very basic. So you'll just end up firing that event off into the ether. There's nothing there listening for it, and you'll lose that data. This makes sure that that data stays there in the published list. And if the subscriber is down when that data is published, as soon as it comes back up, it can read out of that list and continue processing. Um, same with if, if there's some sort of error in the processing, like say it's writing to a SQL database and there's an error doing that, that data is going to stay in the processing list and you can go back and retry at some other point. All right. <clears throat> OK, so event sourcing is um, just takes the, the idea of, of event-driven services one step further. Um, and the idea is that you, you persist all of those events. So if you have an object that is being updated, um, over time, you're saving all of, those, all of those different updates. So you know, say, for example, you have an order. Um, it's got a lot of different things that can happen to it. So you create an order. Um, and then in, in your event store, you're creating a new empty order object. Um, then you're updating. You have a quantity updated event that's fired. You're storing that. Um, applying it to your, your empty order with a quantity of zero. Now you end up with uh, an order with a quantity of two. Now your order is deleted. You store an order deleted event in your event, in your, uh, in your event store. And now it's just got active set to false. So even though it's been deleted, you know, in a, in a traditional sort of database where you're storing just the current state, you're going to delete that row out of there and you've lost all of that all of that history. So now, even though this order has been deleted, we can still go back and look at any point in time what the state of that particular order was. All right, so um, to implement this in Redis, um, and I do want to say at this point, too, that a lot of what I'm talking about here today is, is being um, made a little bit uh, obsolete by, um, by the, new, the uh, new data structure in Redis. Somebody remind me what it's called. I'm totally speaking. Yes, streams. <laughs> Thank you. OK. Yeah so, um, yeah, so a lot of this streams will make this a lot simpler and a lot easier, actually. So um, that's all right. Say la vie. Such is the, the life in our uh, industry. Um, so to continue, um, so the way that, this, that we've implemented this event store in Redis is that it's set up with uh, using two data structures. So we've got a list, um, what we call a commit list, that basically just stores a list of commit IDs. And most of the time, those are just GUIDs. Um, so it's whenever you create an event and store it, um, that commit ID is stored in the list. And since uh, the list maintains order. We know that the events in there are always in the, the order that they were created. Um, so then we've got a set of hashes that store the actual data um, serialized to JSON that's associated with any particular event. Um, so each commit ID in the commit list um, associates to uh, a, commit, uh, a field in one or more of these hashes that contains the data. So if you want to get the whole history of a particular object, you grab its, its list. Um, and it's based, the list is based on what we call an aggregate ID. So this right here 
is the aggregate ID in the, that GUID in the key for the commit list. So you can grab that whole commit list and then iterate through each of those events, each of those IDs in the commit list and grab the event data out of the event store. Um, so one thing about this, when we first implemented this, we were using one hash for each event store. And if you're doing that in a Redis cluster, um, you're going to end up with, you know, if you have one event store that's storing a lot more data than another one, you're going to have one node in your Redis cluster that is doing a whole lot of work with a, other ones not doing much at all. Um, so what we ended up doing was just uh, implementing, um, you know, a basic sort of partitioning strategy, very similar to what Redis does with its hash slots. Um, so we basically just take that commit ID, uh, do a CRC32 hash on it, and then modulo, uh, so this is sort of an arbitrary number, but um, that, that ensures that stuff, that the, the hashes are distributed evenly across the cluster. Uh, okay, so that's the event store. So one, one more strategy here is command query responsibility segregation, um, separation segregation. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of times you hear um, event sourcing and CQRS kind of talked about as the same thing. Um, they're not really the same thing. They're not mutually exclusive. You can use one without the other. Uh, they just tend to make a lot of sense together. Um, so basically what we're doing here is you have commands and you have queries. So commands are things that update data. Queries are uh, things that get data. Uh, so in, this, in the event sourcing example, um, commands are basically going to be firing events and writing to our event store. And then from there, uh, we have subscribers on the other side that are taking the data in that event and storing it in a, a read data store. So that, that data store can be you know, anything you want. It could be a SQL database. It could be another Redis instance. Um, it could be whatever you want. And it, can, it can be, the great thing about this is that that read store can be optimized for reading or for, it can be a subset of just of the data that's in that event tailored to a particular application. All right, so let's, um, let me get a drink of water, and then we'll jump into a little, to a demo. All right. Oh. Where'd my demo go? Uh oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> AV problems. Of course. <laughs> I'm just going to try unplugging this. Uh. No, no. No, I've just got nothing on the screen here. Plug, everything's fine. Uh, we'll pull it up first. Let's, let's see. This is our system. Yeah, as soon as I plug it in, it just kills everything. Got that, but I can't see it on my screen. Okay. <laughs> okay, I guess I'll just have to look over here. Uh, no, it's the. 
mini display. Uh, no, I'm uh, on here. Yeah, well, we got this is HDMI. I'm saying, do you have this input on here? here. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. No. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess uh, I'll just do it looking over here. Cool. <laughs> okay. This is going to be interesting. All right, so. Um, okay, so like I said, this is a, a .NET Core um, application. There's a demo here, and then we've got the library code down here. So learning.event stores is on GitHub. Uh, so just to take a look at how this is um, organized here a little bit. So. We've got, so we've got our write model here, which is basically just a set of commands. Um, so we've got, oh, and just some background on this. This is just sort of a, the demo application is just sort of a generic inventory tracking app. Um, so we've got some basic commands here, create an inventory item, remove items from the inventory, check in items, et cetera. Um, so, that's our, that's our write model. That's just writing to the event store. Then over here on the read side, um, we've got all of our subscriptions that are going to listen for those uh, Redis events. We've got, uh, and those subscriptions are going to write, write data to an in-memory sort of database that's running inside of here. Um, then we've got queries to get data out of that. Um, so we've got the events here, and these are, just look at one of these. These are super simple. I mean, they're just, um, just you know, basic objects that contain the data that are going to be in the event. And uh, these, uh, when we use these at learning.com, we actually have all of the events in a, a Git submodule that we can share between applications so that they can easily listen to events that are coming out of other services. Um, and then we've got here our aggregates. So um, aggregates, if you're familiar with domain-driven design, that's uh, the same kind of idea. It's just uh, the basic sort of domain um, object for the application. So in this case, it's uh, an inventory item. Um, so in here we've got, this is kind of the, the meat of the thing. What we've got in here is the logic for constructing a, an instance of this object at a point in time. So you've got all of the various things that can happen. You, you can create one, uh, you can remove stuff, you can check one in. Um, and what happens here is when, when it gets data out of the event store, it'll get that JSON object, it'll deserialize it, and then um, through some reflection, it'll find the appropriate apply method in here to then pass that uh, event data into and then apply whatever is in here to, to the object. Um, so let's see if, let's just go ahead and run this. <laughs> All right, so first, gonna fire up Redis on here. And then over here, we'll start a monitor so you can see what's going on. Okay, back over here. Start this up. All right, so 
this first breakpoint here, the, the first thing it's going to do um, is it's going to go through and find all of the classes in here that implement this I subscription interface. And it's going to call this subscribe async method on each of those. And what that is going to do is uh, subscribe to the appropriate uh, Redis pub sub channel to listen for events coming off of that. Um, and it's also going to add itself to, um, to that subscriber set for that particular event. Um, so we'll just keep on going here. And we'll go back over to our monitor here. All right, so you can see here what it's doing. So it's adding itself to this set, to this inventory item created set. It's adding its application name. So um, yeah, this is actually, as far as how I understand consumer groups or work, this is sort of similar in concept to how those are going to work. Um, and then the other thing it's doing here is it's checking this published events list. So every time it comes up, it's going to check, check if it has any published events in its list that it needs to process. So if it was down for a while and there's been events written to its list, it's going to grab all of those and process them when it starts up. Um, and then finally, it's going to subscribe to uh, the Redis pub sub channel named inventory item renamed. All right. so. This isn't going to win any awards for beautiful UI design, so. <laughs> All right, so first off, we will add a new inventory item. All right, so first thing we're doing here is we're, we're calling the creates inventory item um, command. Um, so what that's going to do, it's going to create a new instance of that inventory item aggregate. Oops. And there we go. You can see up here in the constructor, it's calling apply change with inventory item created, which ends up in this inventory item created apply method. So it's giving it a name. All right. Continue. This is going to actually fire the event. All right, and now our subscriber over here in the read model has picked up that event that's been fired to Redis, and it's going to write it to our in-memory database. So that's the, that's the callback that we registered here when we subscribed to that pub sub channel that's being called. All right. All right, so now we have an item in our uh, in-memory data store. So now we'll do something else. Let's just add some. Oh, first, let's, uh, let's look at our monitor. So you can see here, a whole bunch of stuff happened. <laughs> um, so the first thing here is we, uh, we Expand this a little bit. All right, so first thing here is we wrote to that, to that hash um, in the event store, the event data. Um, we set a multi-exec on, on that commit list. So this is the list that contains all of the commits for that particular aggregate. Then we're going to push. Um, this commit ID into that commit list. Um, then we're going to pull out of the, the subscribers list for that particular event all of the subscribers that are listening for that. Um, then we're going to do an R push. So that this is when this is where the uh, we're going to do a push into the published events, events list um, for that particular subscriber. Then we're going to publish the event to the Redis pub sub channel. And here is where we get into where the subscriber is picking up that event. So it's doing the, 
RPOP L push. It's, say, it's putting it into its processing list, saying now I'm uh, processing this event. Once it's done, it's written that data to that uh, in-memory database. It then removes that data from that processing events list. All right, so if we go back over here. All right, so now we're going to add, um, check in a, an item to that particular inventory. All right, so now here we are in the check in items command handler. So now we're going to load up the, the events that are in the event store with this get async method that for this particular item with this ID. Um, and we'll see what happens inside the aggregate when we do that. OK, so first, it's going to check in that count. OK. Let's see. I'll try another one. We'll do three. Checking in another one. All right. So let's just quickly look at what this looks like in Redis. All right, so, so this is our commit list here. So we've got our three commits that we've made. And then, so these are the hashes that correspond to each of the commits in that list that contain the actual event data. Um, so this is our created one. That's one of our checked in ones. Another one of the checked in ones. Um, and so this is the, an example of that subscribers list. And right now there's only one. Um, but if we had multiple other services listening to that particular uh, inventory item, what is this one? Renamed event, there would be multiple different applications listed in here, and then we create a pub sub-channel for each one of those. So that's basically that. Let's see if I can get back to the presentation here. OK. That worked. OK. All right, so, um, so some of the lessons that we learned uh, by implementing this. Um, first of all, event sourcing is not always the right solution. Um, Martin Fowler said it best, and he said, if you're building a whole application using event sourcing, you're probably doing it wrong. Um, it really needs to be the right kind of data where preserving that history is important to you, and there's a compelling business reason to do that. Um, so for example, at learning.com, we, um, you know, students take lessons and then they get a score when they take those lessons and they can take the same lesson multiple times. And preserving that history is really important to us because we want to be able to track progress, um, you know, do analytics on, on uh, the performance of students as they take lesson, multiple lessons. Um, so you really have to think about whether it's the right fit or not because there is obviously some additional complexity to it. Um, second thing, Storing all of that event data in Redis can get expensive. It's an in-memory in data store. Um, and it can also be a little bit hard to query. Um, so uh, both of those things are not insurmountable. Um, you know, for, we're a pretty small company, so storing you know, hundreds of gigabytes in Redis is, is not really feasible for us. But for other people, it might be. Um, and other things like the Redis on Flash stuff sounds really interesting because it might take care of that very problem. Um, and then as far as being able to query it, uh, that can probably be solved with modules like RAJSON. Um, 
but for a lot of our bigger event stores at learning.com, we've actually moved to storing that event data in Postgres and just using Redis as a messaging system. Um, and then finally, uh, with that, um, the library that we've developed, race conditions are definitely a possibility if you're running multiple instances of a particular service. They might be trying to do updates at the same time. Um, you can end up with um, events being written out of order. Uh, can turn into a mess. So using a distributed lock, um, such as uh, the red lock algorithm, is uh, definitely needed if you're using this running multiple instances of the service. So um, all right. So distributed systems are hard. Um, but uh, by making them event-driven um, and using patterns like event sourcing and CQRS, uh, we can um, hopefully take care of some of those, the challenges of communication between services. And uh, so here's some additional resources. Um, there's the documentation about that rpopl push command that has that uh, reliable queue pattern in it. Um, there's a blog post on this on the same topic that I just talked about here. Um, and then the, the code that was in the demo is available here on, on GitHub. Um, and it's also available as a NuGet package. Um, unfortunately, right now, the documentation is a bit lacking, but I'm hoping to get that taken care of soon. So um, I'll leave this up if anybody wants to write stuff down. And if anybody has any questions, happy to answer them. Yeah. If you could just like make that in like one sentence, what would be the difference? Um, so CQRS is mostly sort of a data access pattern. Um, so you know, instead of having create, update, delete, you basically um, distill that down into commands that are updating or creating data and queries that are getting data. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh you talked about uh, streams uh, replacing this pub sub. Uh, how would they replace uh, in event, event sourcing and querying history of events and how, how it will work? Yeah, um, I, it, it, streams won't replace the pub sub part of this, um, but the part where we're storing the commit IDs in a, in a list and then the actual event data in hash, you know, in, in Redis hashes. I think that that can probably be condensed down to just using a Redis stream for that functionality there. And then also that when I was talking about the subscriber sets, um, as far as I understand it, I'm no expert on streams yet, but um, there's the, the concept of consumer groups, which is, I think, very similar to that idea where you're keeping track of um, what is subscribing to a particular event. Yeah. All right, anyone else? All right, well, thanks a lot. <laughs>